Our guest in this uh, segment of the program is Kent Leonhart. He is the Agricultural Commissioner, running for re-election, too, I might add, in the state of West Virginia. Kent, good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Good morning, Rob. Mike, it's great to be with you guys. You were in Berkeley County yesterday, is that correct, Kent? Yeah, yes, I was. Okay, yes, I was. Let's uh, talk about that. Familiarize me, because I was not even aware of this whole Apple situation. There was something about this, I remember, a year or two ago, and then I hadn't heard anything about it since. What's going on? Yeah, give us the backstory. Yeah, well, well, last year, uh, just before harvest time, the uh, processors of West Virginia-grown apples, uh, those that go into juice and applesauce and other uh, products, not the ones that go on the actual grocery store shelf that look all nice and, and beautiful, uh, we're told, we're not going to take all your apples. We're only going to take a small percentage. And we had, we were left facing a potential of letting all these apples drop on the ground, uh, the potential of our orchardists, you know, just being fed up with the industry and plowing trees under. And we were getting reports that there, the processors were getting concentrate from other countries and mixing it uh, and producing the apple juice and all because it was easier or less expensive than mashing up our apples and using them and going the full process. And uh, so we started looking into potential solutions, other markets, and uh, talking with our uh, U.S. senators. And I got to tell you, Manchin and uh, Capitol's office have been great to work with on all this. Uh, they've really uh, been advocates for the uh, growers in the eastern panhandle. They've been talking uh, with the USDA for us. So, But last year, and uh, Senator Manchin in particular, was able to secure some funding for us uh, through the USDA Ag Marketing Service, and that funding was designated to go to help feed the food insecure throughout our nation. So... The money went appropriately, but it came to West Virginia and the, to the Department of Agriculture, and we allocated the funding and bought apples and made sure it got into the food banks around the world. And the way we did this was uh, at a National Association of State Departments of Agriculture meeting, I met a gentleman that is running a group called FarmLink, and FarmLink takes donated foods and, and makes distributions. Uh, does it inter, uh, nationally all over, and they're very involved in feeding the insecure and the feeding America food banks. I said we need to talk, and we we're just getting into this. You know, Department of Agriculture was ready to do whatever we needed to do to buy the apples, get them distributed. But this became a great partnership, and they had some funding uh, through donations, being a nonprofit organization, and they helped us with the distribution. So we ended up moving 600,000 uh, bushels of apples out of West Virginia and stayed in Appalachia primarily uh, to feed the food insecure. So what a great success. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, I'm very proud to say, we were very judicious. We had some money left over, um, and I'll get into that in a few moments, but the fact what we accomplished became well-known throughout the USDA, and there's been a lot of advocacy to help the food insecure and use this model uh, throughout, throughout the nation. So fast forward to, the, you know, the apple growers were happy. We saved our industry in West Virginia. The apple growers were happy. They got paid a fair price, and people got fed. I just might add that, the apple is considered the gold standard for food insecurity. Why? Because it's fresh, it's nutritious, and it keeps. It's, shelf, it's more shelf-stable than a peach or a plum mm -hmm. or a pear. So that's, that's very important when you're uh, dealing with food and trying to make sure those that are hungry get fed. So anyway, so we're, we come into another bumper crop this year of uh, apples, not just here in West Virginia, they and you know we thought we were going to be hurt by the drought, uh, but we ended up uh, the apple uh, producers ended up being okay. Some were hurt, some were not, but overall we did pretty well. We're going to be pretty close to what we had last year. 
The West Coast, on the other hand, they had a huge bumper crop. Uh, and USDA is allocating funding to buy fresh apples for uh, feeding uh, the insecure again, just like they always do. The money's not a lot this year, and it's going to be divided up. The model that West Virginia developed last year is going to be kind of divided up among many more states. You know, Pennsylvania's going to get a piece, Maryland, Virginia, everybody's going to get a little bit of a piece. So, so we come up to this year, uh, we think we're in pretty good shape, and then again we get notification that, oh, we're not going to buy as many apples as we thought we were going to buy, and West Virginia's back in the same boat. So, uh, so Ken, th this is a is this a problem caused by the bumper crop, or is this a problem caused by the um, the the, the buyers of the apples not buying as many because they're getting them from overseas. Uh, it's both. We had a we had a great crop of apples, but we're also, <clears throat> and I don't have all the figures, so don't quote me on this. But we're also finding an awful lot of concentrate coming from other con countries, and that is part of the issue. Uh, there might be a consumption issue too. You know, applesauce isn't being eaten as much. Um, maybe, I suggested yesterday maybe we need to flavor the applesauce more to give people more variety so they want to eat it. Uh, but part, I think it's a three thing. It's, it's the consumption level, it's the bumper crop, and it's the uh, import. And the manufacturers are trying to make a living. And if you go to the grocery store, please look at the back of that. If you're going to buy apple juice, look at the back and see where those apples are coming from. By the brand that's using mostly U.S. apples, please. Kent, was there uh, a, was there a connection with the French involved in this apple situation? Yes, yeah, so I was told by one of the producers that they were told that uh, they were going to buy more concentrate and the French puree for um, applesauce uh, and what other uh, products that they're going to make out of it. So, yeah, France was involved in some of this and. You know, a lot of these nations are subsidized in their agricultural commodities so they can do this and make it, uh, sell it to the U.S. cheap. You know, my, my status stands is, you know, food security is national security. We should be making sure that the policies have, uh, are using U.S. grown products first. We can't afford to let our agricultural industry suffer for the benefit of another nation, and then if something happens and we can't get any of those imports, then what are we going to do here in the United States? So we've got to make sure our agricultural industry is secure. And I also want to also talk, I mean, I'm, I'm joining a group that is just starting to get together, and we're going to be looking into imports of food products that don't meet, meet the same safety standards that U.S. producers have to meet. You know, there's, uh, you know, some of the, uh, just recently in the last six months, there's been two recalls of apple juice for an increased level of heavy metals. Um, that probably wouldn't happen with U.S. producers. It can happen, but not necessarily to the extent that, that we're seeing. So my goal is to work with other states and other agriculture commissioners and bring to light and make sure that we end up uh, having a national standard and, uh, and that we hold importers accountable to the same standards that we hold our own producers. Did a French company buy the um, processing facility? Is that, did I hear that correctly? I, I don't know about that for sure. I can't, I can't speak to that. And um, do you know if there's a you know, connection? We have a, lot of, we have a lot of foreign ownership of uh, food processing in the yeah. United States. You know, I mean, let's face it. I mean, you know, JBS, the largest meat processor, is Brazilian-owned. Uh, there's uh, Chinese connections to Smithfield. There's uh, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, I understand that there's some processing owned by the by Saudi Arabian uh, entities. So, you know, so if it's profitable there's for these a lot these of other investment in the United States. <laughs> so if there's if it's profitable for these other nations to invest in our processing facilities, why are Americans not investing in that? Or American companies not investing in that? Kent, uh, that's a good question. I'm I'm not the uh, ag economist. Right. Uh, I'm I'm just working hard to make sure that 
our citizens eat from a, a safe and healthy food supply. Well, Kent, I'm doing my part. I eat an apple a day most days. I do, too, actually. And, uh, you know, I did an interview with you folks uh, yesterday on the drought situation with your station, and I ended up, I told them I was going to eat an apple on my way up to the meeting, and I did. <laughs> Speak. Uh, and then I got, I did get some peaches uh, up there yesterday and brought them home uh, to help the economy with the uh, with our orchardists. But, I mean, I love our peaches, and I love our apples. Uh, I ate another apple out of one of the orchards there yesterday. It was absolutely delicious. Speaking of the drought situation, we have uh, Colin has that map, our producer, he's putting on the screen uh, as we speak here. Discuss the drought situation in West Virginia uh, throughout the summer and currently. Is it still severe drought for many parts of our state, Kent? It is still severe. Uh, I don't know the result of last night's rains in the northern uh, part of the state. Uh, I haven't gotten those reports yet. Uh, But even with immediate rain you know it helps some and we we're we're thankful for it but we can't say that we're just because you get one rain or like you did in the eastern panhandle where parts got six to seven inches of rain and that really helped like the apple crop i mean the timing was was great to help us and but that doesn't mean we're out of a drought situation. That doesn't mean our streams aren't low. That doesn't mean our water tables aren't a little bit lower. That doesn't mean, you know, some of the uh, wildlife has some issues. Uh, that there's a whole lot of things that go on to this, and it's going to take a series of steady rains. You know, when you get a big heavy rain right away on a very dry soil, a lot of it runs off. That's good for the streams and rivers, but it doesn't get to the moisture and get to the depth of the roots that we need. So, we're not out of the drought situation yet. The rain is welcome. Uh, the forecast says we've got a good chance to get some more. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is working very closely with USDA agencies, the West Virginia Conservation Agency. If you go to our website, you can get you can go directly to a link uh, for resources for the drought. And we're still trying to do uh, more and more and try to ex- find the resources to expand the help. This is an unprecedented drought, at least in my lifetime. 1930 was probably the last one that was anywhere close to this. Uh, and again, it's been very spotty. Some areas got hit harder than others. Initially, the eastern panhandle was the worst. Now central West Virginia over towards Wood, Mason, and uh, Jackson County are in the worst shape. Yeah, I was, I was looking at that when we had the map up a moment ago. Colin's going to move that over again so that our uh, viewers on TV10 and Facebook live stream can see that as well. And that's a pretty big area of dark red in the middle of the state that we're looking at right there. And then, uh, the, Right. And that dark red used to be over your right. listening area before, a few weeks ago. Have, have we, because of that, have we seen a downturn in crop production? Yes, we have seen a downturn in crop production. We've seen a downturn in vegetables. And, uh, you know, some of those farmers in crop have crop insurance. That doesn't make up for the profit they would have had with a good crop, but it does help make up the cost of putting the crop in the ground. So essentially a farmer with crop insurance loses a crop, gets reimbursed. He goes without an income from that crop this year, that year. Do you pick up? Uh, he do you, doesn't have as big a loss, but he do, goes without an income. And you know, how many of us can go without an income for a year? Only my corned beef, from based what I can tell from owning this place. Uh, <laughs> but uh, do you pick up the phone, Kent, and call Western states and talk to their ag commissioners and say, "Hey, what what are some methods of dealing with a historic drought? We don't we don't get those all the time in West Virginia, but in the West, they are, have become much more accustomed to it." Well, I haven't called those individuals. I see those individuals on a regular basis uh, through national meetings and all. Uh, we work with our extension service, obviously. Uh, they're the ones that go- are to go out and educate the farmer on things of that nature. We do the education, too, obviously. Everybody's, everybody's into this, this together. We're, we've got some great partnerships we've formed over the last uh, seven and a half years or almost eight years now with the uh, universities, uh, the college, uh, the uh, the USDA programs, Natural Resource Conservation Service, they get a lot of the information out there. And I've talked to other farmers about strategies when a drought hits and 
And then we're trying to, as we develop these, because this is all new to us too, uh, we're trying to develop strategies in our conservation programs that can help, you know, the next time. Each time something happens, you you learn something from it, and you try to make sure it's better so if it happens again, the damage isn't as great. But fortunately, with the, like the conservation agency, we had drought uh, uh, programs already in place, and we were able to execute it. Um, and then we had a lot of people step up. Fire departments have stepped up. Uh, the governor set up that grant program to reimburse government agencies uh, for expenses during the drought, and that included the fire departments that uh, ended up hauling water and had an expense to help the farmers out. Uh, so those type of things have all helped, and we're going to continue to try. The, right now, my biggest concern is the uh, winter feed supply for our livestock uh, because the grass hasn't grown, and then come – uh, next spring when we do start getting moisture, that if we've lost any pastures totally, uh, you know, the grass is totally dead. I mean, a lot of time grass goes dormant in a drought, then it comes back. Uh, you don't have the have the grass to feed the animals that year, but uh, next year they, they come back. But there's going to be some areas of the state that, where the grass totally dies. And I want to make sure that we have some way to help with reseeding, because I don't want those uh good grass pastures to come back into a lot of weeds. And then that then hinders the farmer the next year as he tries to uh, uh, grow his livestock. It slows the growth. We, you know, we just need to do everything we can to, for the healthy soil, you know, because a lot of weedy soils also causes a lot of erosion. And, you know, you're in the Eastern Panhandle, you're in the Chesapeake Bay area. We've done a great job in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, meeting the uh, 2025 goals and we're the first state to meet them and we're ahead of everybody else and i want to make sure that we stay that way and we don't want to go take a step back what is and i was about to ask about livestock farms because we think drought we think fruits vegetables but livestock is a big issue too and you just addressed that what's the farm service agency kent and uh, why would people want to register with that well the usda farm service agent is it, like I just said, it's part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They have the emergency programs, majority of the emergency programs that are being executed to help farmers pay for their loss. Um, it doesn't cover 100%, but it covers some of it. The other, So it's important that the farmers register with the Farm Service Agency, get familiar with the programs, and get, get involved uh, with with them. The programs are going to help them relieve some of the pain that they're suffering. And at the same time, you, when you tell that data and you do your registration and tell the FSA what's going on, that goes into the National uh, Weather Observe, Observation folks. And that data then helps determine whether you're in a D3 or D4, D4 being the worst drought there is, which is where Part, those three counties I mentioned earlier are, and that data, and the higher the the drought level, kicks in more programs uh, for funding and and for assistance. So it's very important that our farmers register with the FSA, tell them what's going on, get start signing up, and the FSA is doing a great job. They're trying to go out and examine everything and get this right. And I ask everybody just to be a little bit patient, not only with them, but everybody in the agricultural support business, uh, a little bit of patience. I, like I said, this is a drought of a lifetime. Uh, it's new to a lot of us. Uh, we're learning as we go along. And a little bit of patience will go a long way, and, and we'll get done. And I've got faith in the uh, West Virginia farmer. We're going to come back from this. You know, we were growing agriculture until – this drought hit it's going to set us back a little bit you know let's let's be real about it but the plans and the programs that we have in place for a normal year are going to help us uh, bounce back i've got faith in our in our industry are there any crops which have survived the drought better than others uh that's a good question it's it's been more of a regional issue on you know how much water we've gotten and and the management practices of the individual farmer. 
You know, I've gone by places down in Greenbrier County where the corn is above my head. Uh, and then I go to buy places uh, where the corn is short, all in the same county. A lot of it's the timing of the of the planting, uh, and when the moisture hit that the moisture we did get hit, just like it did at apples. It hit it hit at the right time. One grower told me yesterday, hit that you know that hurricane rain we got hit at just the right time, and their apples looked good. Can't we appropriated some money in this last session for your new ag lab? Can you talk a little bit about that and where you are in the process? Is that uh, is that started? Well, we still have to have further discussion on that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fully supportive of West Virginia State University. Um, I want them to succeed. I'm excited when people want to do agriculture um, at our higher institutions and teach more folks about agriculture. Um, we're still in the planning stages uh, on how that's all going to work out. And what exactly does, for those that don't know, what does an ag lab actually do for you, for your department? Well, we do a lot of consumer protection. Um, part of our labs test the uh, soft-serve ice cream that you enjoy at uh, various fast food restaurants to make sure it's safe. We test your pet food. Uh, the pet food companies pay a fee to the state of West Virginia, and then when pet food is sold, uh, we get a we get a, a little fee. And then we go out and we sample these pet foods to make sure that what's on the label is actually on the label. So the label is correct. So, like, if you go to your veterinarian, your veterinarian says, make sure this animal has at least 14% protein in its diet. When you read that label, that you get that 14%. So it's a consumer protection, uh, a lot of consumer protection. Uh, we test, and I have uh, pulled... Uh, various products off the shelf for not being label compliant. Uh, we have actually uh, had farmers, you know, we'll test lime and fertilizer. And if the fertilizer isn't what the farmer thought he was getting, that company will then end up reimbursing the farmer uh, for the uh, shortage in the, in the ingredients uh, within the fertilizer. So there's a lot of consumer protection. Uh, it's, it's paid for by fees from the industry, uh, not necessarily taxpayer dollars. Uh, we have our own meat inspection program, uh, which I would rather have a West Virginia inspecting things than a, a bureaucrat. I've got cooperative agreements with the USDA and FDA on a lot of things so that we have West Virginians uh, working with our, our producers, uh, and we want to bring them into, and a lot of the regulations are federal, but we want them to, we want to educate and bring them into compliance before we do any penalizing. And it's a lot easier if I'm doing it with West Virginians than having somebody from Washington come out. Kent, I want to thank you very much for your time this morning and let you know that I will volunteer to be your soft serve ice cream taste tester. If there's an issue there one way or the other, just give me a call. I got you oh, covered. Unless I'll, it's bad. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's bad, yeah. <laughs> uh, good to talk with you again today, Kent. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. And, uh, you know, just pray for more rain and steady rain. Indeed, sir. Have a great day. Thank you so much.